too much time, I just wanted to say a few thank yous before we get started um, to our wonderful guests this morning for coming out. And of course, to YWC Parent Awareness and Courtney Darby for helping organize this event and bring all of you out here. Um, and I'd also like to say a thank you to the Friends of Darien Library uh, without these generous contributions that each year to our annual campaign, uh, we wouldn't be able to put on amazing programs like the one we're about to do this morning. Uh, just a couple notes, if you are tweeting, uh, there is a hashtag, it's hashtag building resilience, not resistance, we're trying not to start a revolution just yet. Uh, so building resilience is the hashtag. I'll try to be live tweeting the event uh, for people who can't be here in person. We're also going to record um, the presentation portion uh, this morning, but we're not going to record the Q&A. So once we're ready to take your questions, you don't have to feel that you're being recorded for posterity. We will turn off the cameras at that point. Oh, yes. At Dr. Donna B. is Dr. Donna B. Um, is the uh, handle. Good morning. Thank you all for coming, and obviously special thanks to the Darien Library for hosting this program. Um, one quick note before we start. There were some books on the sign-in table. Those are actually library books, so if you could just make sure you sign them out, um, that would be great. Uh, we also will be selling books at the, at the end, and once we get started, um, they're $15, and they'll be out there at, at the uh, table. Um, another, just quick things on the parent awareness front, I wanted to make you aware. Um, we have some wonderful events coming up. Um, the first is um, Drinking Drugs and Teen Relationships, What You Should Know. That's October 30th at the Darien Town Hall um, at 7.30 p.m. Um, that is an event that we are sponsoring with Thriving Youth, the Darien Domestic Abuse Partnership, and SAD. Um, and um, as many of you know, uh, Thriving Youth right now is going out to many of the schools to discuss the survey in greater detail and the assets. This is a, we've actually coordinated with them to first kind of give people an education about the assets and then a follow-on event because um, risky behaviors are significant in this community. Um, if you look at the survey, over 50% of Darien seniors are drinking every month and 40% indicate that they have used marijuana in the last year. So it's a big issue and it you know, continues to be even from the first and the last survey. Um, so this provides some really wonderful expert commentary and advice and strategies Barbara Greenberg wrote Teenage as a Second Language. Um, Jamie Rory Roche is a pediatrician in town. So a very packed panel. We really hope you can make it. Um, in addition, on November 15th, we have a mother-daughter event. It's a film called Finding Kind. And it's, it's really about putting the end to Mean Girls. Um, it's really a wonderful film, and we hope you can join, it, join us. Um, for all of our events, we now have online registration. If you go to uh, ywcadarianorwark.com, um, you can go right online and register so that we can, you know, I know a number of people did today, and that's really wonderful because then we can let you know, you know, if we're really hitting capacity and whether or not you need to get there early or if there are parking issues or if there's a snowstorm. So we appreciate you, you following through with that. Um, we also really appreciate all of your support. Uh, without you, there would be no parent awareness. Um, we hope you will fill out the evaluations this morning because it really helps us to guide what our programming. Um, and now I would just take, like to take a quick minute to introduce our wonderful guests this morning. Um, first, we have Edward Moran of Family Centers. He is a licensed clinical social worker at Family Centers in Darien, where he provides counseling and support for children and teens. He has developed and presented programs for private and public school students, parents, teachers, and school administrators on preventing peer bullying and developing leadership and communication skills in young people. Prior to his career in social work, he was in the broadcast communication field in Fairfield County and Providence, Rhode Island. He holds a Master's of Social Work from Fordham University. He is also right now running parent support groups on Wednesdays at Family Centers, and you can um, feel free to speak to him at the end if you'd like more information about that. Um, next, we have um, Donna Valpietta, who is an educator and author and passionate about the field of resilience. Um, it's most ed evident by, she just came out with a new book, um, The Resilience Formula, Proactive, Not Reactive Parenting, co-authored by bullying expert Joel ha Haber. Um, it's actually a wonderful book, really easy, hands-on strategy, so I definitely recommend it. Um, she also co-created Name Tags, an education program for the One Revolution Foundation, which teaches students 
that it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. She is an education advisor for Kids Helping Kids, a nonprofit organization dedicated to developing leaders through youth-led service projects. She gives um, regular presentations at professional conferences, has written several articles, <coughs> and also writes for the blog ModernMom.com. Please welcome our speakers. Thank you. Hearing? Yes, it's not working. It's not working. through the speakers. No one has ever told me that I need to speak louder. <laughs> so, um, welcome. I, I'm really, really excited to see how many people came out today, moms and dads. In fact, about people. You guys followed my dumb. <laughs> um, this is you know, such a remarkable topic because it covers so many areas of child life of an adult's life, he speaks to the child's experience, it speaks to the adult the parent's experience, it speaks to so many different things when we talk about the value of failure. Uh, there's an article that I wrote, a brief article from local paper, the copies of it are back there. In the article, an example of uh, uh, standing in line at the grocery store, hearing a woman talk to her husband on the phone, I assume it was her husband, about their son who had just been cut from the team. And was really, really disappointed. And the most perspective was, well, you got to call the coach. Call the coach, call the league, call it, call the lawyers, call it. Uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating only a little bit. And he took every ounce of energy within me to mind my own business. But in the back of my mind, please don't do that to your child. Please, please, please don't do that. Uh, you know, help them understand that this is a part of life. This disappointment is what we have to experience if we're ever going to really be successful as young people, as adults, as parents in the workforce, in every area of our life. We need these skills. These are crucial skills. And it is very, very difficult as a parent to watch. You know, I appreciate that. That if any time during my, and I have to remember, keep my time in here. If at any time I feel like I'm making this sound easy for you, please raise your hand and throw something at me do something. Because I understand this is not an easy thing to do. It's really, really difficult to sit and watch your child be uncomfortable. Um, but it's so necessary. And I'm jumping ahead just a little bit. But that experience is what really led me to, uh, to start working on workshops surrounding the value of failure, uh, of resilience. And, and I was asked to present the last year on this. And uh, the organization invited me and said, do you, do you have to use the word failure in your title? So, <laughs> uh, and, and I respect that, right? But what I, what I feel is we need to really really try our best to kneel down and look at the world through the eyes of our children. Because in their perception, these are failures, right? That we have adult experience. We assign our, our life experience to what our child is experiencing, and we're missing the boat there. But we really need to be able to do our best to feel what they are feeling, and then help them process it. Then help them see what it is for what it is. Um, I, I, I often also share a couple of uh, examples, and I may not get to it in this part of the presentation, but there are, there are some times where I really feel like my parents were on the ball here. Um, and there's one in particular that taught me about not only resilience, but it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a little tiny thing or a really, really big thing. Because what's in the middle is the concept of what's the right thing. Uh, and, and I was probably about seven or eight years old. On the way back from our family vacation, we stopped for gas. This is back when we had to do a little credit card slide. And, um, and I, Dad gave me a quarter to get a bag of chips. That's hungry. Uh, so I go to the gas station. There's nobody in there. There's nobody in the, in the garage. There's nobody in the office. But there's the thing of chips. And the little the stand with all the clips on and all the chips. That like, must be free. <laughs> so I grab my bag of chips, got back in the car. 20 minutes later, I'm eating my chips. And I'm flipping my quarter. And my brother says, wait a minute. Why don't you still have your quarter? Silence in the car. <laughs> my father. Why do you still have your court? I said, they were free. Says, How do you know they were free? Well, there was nobody in there. Dad knew just as well as I did that I had stolen that bag of chips report. When we got home, see, this was, he wasn't going to go back. My dad did not try home. <laughs> he wasn't going to go back. But when we got home, the moment we walked in the door, before the luggage was out of the car, he sat me down at the kitchen table, and he said, look, 
was right. was wrong. I understand it was an accident. I understand your intent was not to steal. But you did take something that didn't belong to you and you took it without paying for it. So you have to fix it. And so he sat me down and gave me the receipt from, from the credit card. So I had the address of the gas station. And I had to write a letter to the manager of the gas station telling him what I had done. And I wrote the letter and, and, and sent it off. I never really expected to hear anything back. And this is where the follow-through is so important. And I know I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but I think talking about the follow-through is so important because we need the reinforcement. Uh, I long forgot about the incident, except whenever I saw a stand full of chips. I get a letter in the mail from the manager of the gas station in New Hampshire. And inside was a note that said, I appreciate your honesty, thank you very much, you did a good thing. And he had taped my nickel change to the paper. <laughs> and the reason, excuse me, the reason why I like that story is that I remember how good it felt, first of all, to, to have somebody recognize that you tried to make something happen. So my parents did the first part by making me feel uncomfortable. They knew that I needed to feel uncomfortable for what I had done. Not that I was a bad person, not that I had awful character, not that I was, you know, it was a behavior that they were highlighting. This was a behavior that is not good. And then they helped me figure out a way to fix it. Now, the reinforcement came. Now, for all I know, my father called that gas station <laughs> after and, and asked them to do this. But it's really irrelevant because the message was already put across. That it didn't matter to me then whether or not my father had called them ahead of time. <clears throat> Just that uh, there had been that reinforcement of fixing something. Now, I understand not everything is going to come with that level of reinforcement. But hopefully it will. Hopefully when we're trying to teach a child resilience to learn from their mistakes, whether it is a consequence that needs to be instilled for behavior, whether it's a natural consequence for not turning their homework or forgetting their books at school, whether it is uh, breaking a rule, breaking curfew, you know, hitting somebody, uh, that they need to feel uncomfortable. They need to feel as though they've done something that was not what you expected them to do. And then they need to do what they can to try to make it right. So, um, I'm sorry, so I've already been sort of way out of myself here. So I love this quote from Winston Churchill. Success is the ability to go from failure to failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. <laughs> this, you know, in one sentence, is resilience. It's the ability to go through life making mistakes and not completely removing yourself from society because you made one. Being able to look at it and say, all right, I, I screwed this up or, or uh, Things didn't go my way, and that happens. And the two I mentioned, and forgive me because I'm forgetting the name of the player, but a year or so ago, there was a note hitter that was, it was lost because of a bad on card call. And the whole nation, how many of you remember this a couple of years ago? Uh, the whole nation was, was you got to give them a no hitter, you got to give them a no hitter. It was wrong, it was wrong, it was a bad call, it was a bad call. Um, and this is similar to the grocery store. It's in the back of my mind of saying, please don't. Please don't give it back. I understand. Everybody could see that it was a no hitter. There was no argument that it was a bad call. The umpire even said it was a bad call, and he apologized. And the pitcher accepted his apology and was wonderful about the fact that he had this problem from a very possibly once in a lifetime experience taken away. But he understood that life was imperfect, and that base, baseball was imperfect. And this was a disappointment that he was going to have to deal with. And I, I was a little disappointed that there weren't more people that were jumping on this in the media from this angle. A lot of debate whether or not the commissioner should overturn, but not a whole lot of conversation and seen about what can we learn from this. A teachable moment. <coughs> so a few key, a few key concepts, and be mindful of them. Uh, feeling hurt or rejected is inevitable. It's going to happen. It's a part of life. We can't keep our kids from, from being rejected or, or feeling uh, feeling hurt. Being able to tolerate this feeling of discomfort is a crucial skill that they will use throughout their life. Kids have lapses of judgment. When I do workshops on bullying, it's really, really important to understand, for example, the difference between a child who's made a bad choice, you know, who is otherwise uh, very healthy and, and, and <coughs> to somebody who truly has significant behavior issues. So we don't want all these be throwing the bullying at every time a child makes a bad choice. Kids make oh, sorry. sorry. Um, and kids test them. It's their job to test them. They're going to test limits, but don't test limits. We all test limits. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to learn how to do it appropriately. And uh, also, your kids are going to 
you know, it may seem like they're doing it deliberately. <laughs> they don't want to. Now, how many of you heard of the 40 developmental assets? A lot of attention to this. We're not going to spend a great amount of time on this right now. I'm just using it mainly as a guide that identified 40 traits. Uh, the kids really need to develop in order to, to make them grow into successful, healthy, emotional, um, responsible students and caring citizens. Uh, and it found that young people with at least 30 are better equipped for success. Um, the developmental assets, if you're interested in doing further research, easy to find on Google. You just do the 40 developmental assets, and then we'll give you the breakdown of various age groups also, what those assets are, and what it means when the child has uh, a certain number. Uh, so a study, 30 or more assets show 3% of use of alcohol, fewer than 10 assets at a 50% of use. So you can see the impact. Um, and the pregnancy and dropout rates are similar as well. So I would encourage you to, to do some research on the, on the 40 development, developmental assets. Okay. All right, so how, what this is all about um, is how are we going to teach our kids to tolerate perceived rejection and failure? I highlight perceived because, again, we're looking at, them, at their experience with our adult experience. Uh, and we miss things that way. If we're really, how many, you know, I think a lot of you, thinking from my era of life, how many remember the, the six million dollar man? <laughs> good, I was pretty good at okay. How many of you are in the action figure, the six million dollar man? Okay. And in the back, you can turn around, you can look through his eyes. And I, I like that image, because that's really what we need to do. We need to stand behind the kids, we need to look through the hole in their eyes, and we need to see the world through their, through their eyes so that we can better understand what they're feeling. We aren't necessarily saying that they should be feeling that way. We're saying that they do feel that way. And we need to start by being able to see that they do look at it that way. Because from there, we can work with them on putting it in, in maybe a healthier respect. Is instilling a sense of responsibilities for behaviors, both positive and negative, and teaching you how to tolerate the stress. Um, I've had people come into my office who, uh, I think they one, of one young adolescent from another community who was really, really melting down every time he got a, you know, an A minus, or every time he uh, you know, threw one bad pitch or something. And I, I was struck by there were so many kids out there who are really being robbed inadvertently of the ability to develop these coping skills, to be able to say, all right, this pitch really well today. What am I going to work on? I'm going to help me. So then when I go next time, I won't have such a bad day. Or if I had a bad day, if I had bad days, I'm going to go work harder, I'm going to focus, I'm going to figure out what I did wrong, and do it. Rather than, oh God, I just had a bad pitching day, that's it, I'm done. I'm fine. I'm putting the team. I, you know, I just can't tolerate anything that doesn't go well. A really nice skill that you can do without teaching your skills. Um, and taking advantage of teachable moments when we see them. Um, the, the quarter, it was a quarter. In my attitude, it was a quarter. It was seven. My, my parents, it wasn't about a quarter. You could have made a million dollars. You didn't do what you should have done. It's an A to fix it. So it's not about the value of, of, you know, in that case, it wasn't about $20 you know, dollars. It was about me needing to fix something that I did wrong. And we're building confidence and confidence. If we, if we are going through life learning that if something doesn't go our way, we quit, or we isolate, or we go into depression, or we you know, really cease to function as individuals, we've got a real problem. But we need to, to sit down and problem solve with our kids. When we see that they're having difficulty, or when something comes up on television, in the media, there's a teachable moment. The teachable moments don't always have to happen in your house or in school or in the car, sometimes they're happening in the world around us, and we need to grab them. And if we're having dinner together, um, whenever we can, you know, understanding that it's not always possible, but if we're having dinner together whenever we can, these teachable moments come up left and right, and we can really use them as an opportunity to help reinforce what your expectations are, and to problem solve as a family around some of the things that kids are exposed to on a daily basis. And differentiating between passive assertive and, and aggressive. We want a child to learn how to, to sort of assess, all right, I'm feeling weird about this. So something's not right. Something's making me feel upset. So what am I going to do about this? Am I going to go home and cry? Which is fine, by the way. I'm not using that in a, in a, it's often developmentally appropriate. Um, 
or am I going to say, wait a minute, <coughs> just another very brief example where I had a coach. I was not athletic. And I tried, and I, and I was not athletic. And I'm so glad nobody ever said, you're a really good athlete. Because I wasn't. <laughs> but they said, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And they helped me with a disappointment every time I struck out. Every time. <laughs> so, uh, so they helped me deal with the disappointment. I learned how to deal with disappointment. I learned, wait a minute, all right, now this is not for me. I need to find something that is. I was given a coping skill to be able to move from what was not working for me into something that was working for me. So I could have a sense of success. I could have an internal sense of success and comfort was something that I did well. Um, so this coach that was making me feel particularly lousy um, had a conversation with my parents. They said, you need to go talk to him. And you need to roll What did you say to him? What do you want to say to him? What do you want him to know? What do you feel? We had the conversation. My dad said, next time you're going to go talk to him, right? Yeah. All right. And I circled him. Recess, <laughs> recess, I'm out. And he's, he's teacher standing around and I'm just circling. I'm trying to get up there and go talk to him. I go out and I go, Mr. Fine. <laughs> what? I didn't know. He said, what you have? He said, look at me. I looked at him. What do you want? I don't like it when you make me go chase the ball. I was feeling, at that point I was feeling really sort of mistreated in a way. I was always the one that had to go chase the ball. Um, and he got into the accident really glad he told me. I didn't realize that I was making me that all the time. I'll start spreading it around a little bit. Now again, my dad may have called me. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not to get me off the hook, but just to say I'm trying to teach him a lesson here. I can really use your help in reinforcing the lesson we're trying to teach. Um, and it was a very positive experience. I was anxious and I I'm learning a new skill. I need to be uncomfortable. I'm learning to do something that's out of my comfort zone. And then I had the reinforcement from the teacher. You know, pat on the back. I'm glad you, I'm glad you came to talk to me. I hope you feel better about this. Yeah, you might still have to chase the ball every now and then. I'm not going to stop. Maybe you can chase the ball. Uh, but I'll make an effort to make sure I'm spreading it out a little bit. So uh, those were a couple of moments that my parents, my parents used. Um, and I'm going to run through this fairly quickly because I know that this is all going to get covered throughout the rest of the, of the, uh, of the workshop. But you know, acknowledging that you don't expect them to be perfect. I think sometimes kids do work. When they say they don't want to disappoint you, that if they do, they're awful people. And this is where we need to help them be focused. That it's not about character. It's not about what, they're, what they are as a person or who they are as a person. It's about a behavior that they've just engaged in that isn't particularly in their best interest. That you want to help them change. Let them know that you love them unconditionally. That they can do just about anything. Um, and that you're always going to love them. Because uh, that, believe it or not, is a worry. Encouraging them to take responsibility. Now this is, uh, you know, the idea of resilience and, and it can be such a broad topic. I think I mentioned earlier, it could be about a consequence for breaking the rule or breaking something. If we have time, I'll tell you that story. Uh, and, um, or, or, you know, again, not doing homework, so you're getting bad grades. Are we a fellow teacher? No. You didn't turn your homework. You're getting bad grades. Uh, so it, it runs the gamut. It's natural consequences, it's a you know, consequence that, that we are providing for something. Um, and remember, a consequence can be positive as well. Not always a negative consequence. We want to encourage them to take responsibility, praise their ability to admit that they made a mistake. It's so important for us to, to say, all right, all right, yeah, and they're kind of screwed up. Um, mentoring them on how to apologize. Role plays are great, and dinner time is a great place to do the role plays. You can't do that. Just a few minutes to, sit, you know, to see if they want to role play with you about things that you can um, <coughs> talk about what's bothering them. Um, and avoid pointing out past mistakes. We, we, I think we all do this at some point or another. We go all the way back to 1940 something. <laughs> and that one time that you did eight years ago. And that really tends to be counterproductive. That when we're talking about accepting responsibility, we really want to make sure in the moment that we're, you know, we're asking them to accept responsibility for what they did at that, at that moment and not every day. Every single time we go all the way back to the first time we made a mistake. Uh, and help me and to identify their strengths. Um, it's hard, right? We see kids who want to be good at something and it's just not happening and it's either because they're not <coughs> focusing uh, like they want to or maybe they're not inclined in that direction as I was in, in athletics. Um, or we really want to help them identify things that they do. So that they do have kids who grow up with a sense of 
feeling successful. Because we all, we all need to walk around feeling like we've done something well, which can be really hard to tolerate as parents when you're seeing our kids struggle. And I guess where, where do we go with that? What am I doing wrong? If, if when our kids are struggling, reality is we sometimes see it as, as something that we're doing wrong as parents. That's not always the case. But these are some things that we can do right. I'm going to move on now to to be redundant. And thank you very much for your, for your attention. Plenty of time for questions and answers. Okay, we're talking here about resilience. And Ed, thank you. You did a great job telling stories and telling about, about why the resilience is so important. I'm going to give a little bit of a more broad definition of resilience because it helps my case here. So what I'm going to say is that resilience is our response to any challenge. A lot of people look at resilience of, okay, how do you deal with a tragedy? But what I'm going to say here is resilience is our response to any challenge. It doesn't matter whether you're sharing a toy on the playground, learning how to tie your shoe, whether you're getting in the car with a drunk driver, whether you're getting cancer diagnosis. It's all about the same thing. Resilience is how do we deal with challenge. And the problem is we're getting a generation of kids who hasn't learned that. They didn't learn it when they were young, so now they're heading to college. And I don't know whether you've heard about the, the teacup generation. It's a generation of kids that are at college right now who never learn to deal with challenge, and they get to college and they shatter like teacups because they don't know how to deal with it. So what we're talking about here is, okay, how do we build that? How do we use those little challenges to teach kids the skills that they need to get to the bigger challenges? Resilience is based on our understanding of four S's. Any challenge we face is based on our understanding of ourself. Who are we? What do we believe in? What are our values? What's our self-concept? What's our self-confidence? Where's our self-esteem? What do we think about ourselves? Second is the situation. How do we judge that situation? When we face a challenge, do we think automatically that a little tiny challenge is a tragedy? My uh, son was hiking the other day on a school trip, and a dog poop dog. <laughs> he was in the middle, he got dog poop. And he was furious. I said, is this a tragedy? How do we judge this situation? You gotta change your clothes, change your clothes and move on, okay? So we need to be able to judge the situation. Is it something terrible, or is it something little? Is it something that you can deal with? Third is support structures. Do we have people, if we don't know how to deal with it ourselves, do we have people that we can go to? And do we know how to access them? A lot of the times, our parents may say to us, oh, go to the coach and talk to them. They have no idea how to access that. So we need to teach them. That is our job, to teach them about the support structures they have and how to access them. The fourth S is strategies. Do we have specific strategies to employ? I'm going to give you an example of the four S's with um, a real life situation on a playground. So everybody's had little kids on a playground. So I'm on a playground one day, and this little little kid drops his toy. It was at, like Kids U or something. So it's in that place where he couldn't reach it, couldn't reach his toy. So let's see, what are we going to do about this? He sat down and screamed for his mother, who was way across the playground. I'm right next to him. And all he does is sit down and scream, Mom! and. I looked over at him and I said, you know, can't, can't get your toy? He said, no. And I said, would you like to ask me to get it? And he looked at me like I was crazy and screamed, ah! And then he had no strategy. His mom came over, she got the toy, she looked at me, and she walked off with him. Okay? So what's the kid going to do next time? Scream. Ah! That's his strategy. His self-concept is, my mommy can do it for me and that's what I can do. I need my mommy to help me do everything. The situation is, oh my gosh, this is tragic. I can't reach my toy. Support structures, mom. Mom's my only support. If she's not here, it's tragic. Okay? So we need to use those teachable moments to say, you know what? Hey, you dropped your toy. So what are you going to do? Is there a stick around? Is there something that you can use to reach it first? What's a strategy that you have? on your own. Okay, there's no stick, you can't reach it. Your friends over there, they can't reach it either. So let's look around, are there adults that you can ask? Is there somebody else over there? I wasn't looking very, you know, 
suspicious there. I was another mother sitting there with my kid. It wasn't like it was you're asking to go over to a stranger. Teaching them what strangers are okay to ask. Um, teaching them those strategies and support systems. Okay, the next one. Okay, so we're going back to every challenge gives us an opportunity to build those four S's. Anything that we do with our kids, any little little challenge gives us the opportunity. But guess what? Our initial reaction, we are hardwired to react in a way that is counterproductive to teaching resilience. Okay? Get in. Off the hook here. Everybody put, put up your hand. Put up your hand. Guess what this is? It is a model of your brain. Isn't that great? Neuropsychologist taught me that. Okay, put up your hand. This part right here, touch that part right there. That is the most inner part of your brain. It is the reptilian brain that was the most, you know, um, it's the farthest back. In that is housed a little part, it's almond shape, it's called the amygdala. You don't have to remember it, but amygdala. It's like this little almond shaped part here. The amygdala is fight, flight, and protect. That is what the amygdala tells us to do. So you're out in the jungle and a tiger comes. What are you going to do? Fight, flight, or protect? You've got a kid, you've got to protect them. So that is our natural instinct, is our amygdala. Okay? Now this part here, your thumb, you fold it over there, that is your limbic system. Anybody know what the limbic system is based on? Emotion. You have emotion here. The emotion triggers that amygdala. This is our prefrontal cortex. See this part here? And a guy named Dan Siegel came up with this. This was not my idea. He's a neuropsychologist. So, um, actually, he's an interpersonal neurobiologist. So, this this prefrontal cortex. What does that do? What's our prefrontal cortex? Judgment. Judgment. It's our control center. It makes us think. It makes us do logic. Okay. So, what happens when we get an emotion from our thumb? When we get fear? When we get anger? our brain automatically transfers from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. It is a reaction. The reaction is a survival instinct. It's from when we had to deal with tigers. What happens now, though, is that it's counterproductive in these situations. We want to protect fear. We want to protect our kids from failure. So we hit our amygdala, and we run in and we do it for them. We get angry. Anybody ever get angry at their kids? <laughs> no, right? When you get angry, your brain transfers from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. You do not have access to your prefrontal cortex when you are angry at your kids. Isn't that nice? Isn't that great to know? It's just amazing. Once we understand that, we know that we have to move from that prefrontal cortex before we can begin to accurately talk to our kids and teach resilience. So I'm going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that brain part. But first I want to go through developing brains. I'm, I'm really into this neurology stuff. The way that kids' brains develop, think, picture a jungle. Picture, you know, this, you know, the Amazon jungle. Lots of trees, vines, not much that makes sense there. That is what a baby's brain looks like. Okay? They have tons of neurons. Tons of neurons. But there's no direction. There's no, no sort of... Um, organization to it. So what the development of the brain does is that you begin to clear pathways through that jungle. You begin to clear with experiences that you give your children. When you take them to the zoo, the neurons fire and they create a pathway. It's like, oh, that's exciting. That's exciting. Elephant, 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 elephant. Okay? The more you clear those pathways, the more organized the brain gets, right? And you have to keep going over and over to clear those pathways. That happens between birth and about 10 or 11 years old. My oldest is 10. So we are getting to the next stage of development. With boys, it's a little bit later, 11 or 12. Um, and we get to heavy construction. You have from 0 to 11, your brain, the child's brain is very plastic. Whatever you expose them to, those neurons fire, those pathways get, get formed. At about 11 to 12 years old, what happens is two things. First off, the brain, the brain is becoming more sophisticated. The idea here is to get the brain to be more organized, 
to get the brain to be more sophisticated, to get the brain to be faster, more efficient, all that. So two things happen. One, the neurons that have not been fired, have not been used appropriately, get <clears throat> they go away. So the exposure that you have given them from zero to 11, if you have not exposed them to certain things, those neurons get pruned. It's very hard. How many people learned skiing when they were a kid? How many people tried to learn skiing when they were an adult? <laughs> a lot harder. You look at those little twerps who are going down the slope and it seems so easy. Well, it is easy. They have the neurons. You don't. So you have to build them. All right? So you have to build pathways in a different way than those kids do. We lose those abilities. So things are pruned. Isn't that scary? Anybody with a one-year-old kind of up? Oh, my God. Next thing they do is they pay. Okay, think about those pathways through the jungle. Now, we want them faster, right? An adult brain is faster than a kid's brain, thank God. Um, we want them paved. So think about them paving those. That's myelin sheath. It makes it a lot faster. It makes the neural firing much quicker. So what happens is those pathways are paved. But what happens is when they're paved, is it easier to change a paved road or an unpaved road? Unpaved. Once they're paved, they're more permanent. So when we pave them, we make them faster, but we also give up some of that plasticity. So what happens in the brain is that it starts from back here, that development, and then it moves. The last thing to get paved and pruned is your prefrontal cortex. Why do you think that is? Anybody have an 11-year-old? <laughs> Do you want their prefrontal cortex paved right now? <laughs> no. We want them to have as much time as possible to develop that because that's the most important part of your brain. It gives you the logic. The problem is, is that from, 11, from 0 to 23, 24, they don't have that pain. So we're still working on that. Good news is we can still work on it. Bad news is they don't have it yet. So we still need to develop that. They don't have those things. So from 11 on, your kids' brains are going crazy. They're in just crazy time here. Okay, we're going to go to the next part. Okay, part of those pathways that we have the chance to develop, develop something called scripting. Language is a real way that we develop those pathways. We can develop pathways by teaching kids language, literally feeding them the language. It's the easiest, hardest thing they'll ever do. Okay, so it's really easy. All it is is you create the script and then have them repeat it. The idea is that they have to repeat it back to you because that's how their brain pathways get, get clear. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Kid wants a cookie. What does he say? Now what does he say? I want a cookie. What do most parents say? No, most parents say, what do you say, right? Most parents say, what do you say? And then they say, please. Okay, let's think about the brain pathway. What was the brain pathway that they just learned? Can I have a cookie? Let me wait for the response. <laughs> please. And people wonder why they don't say, may I have a cookie, please? That's not their pathway. You have not taught that pathway. You have taught the pathway, may I have a cookie? Please. They're waiting for your response, and they're not going to get that pathway unless you say to them, may I have a cookie, please? And make them repeat back. May I have a cookie, please? And then, how many people, um, what happens when you're listening to the radio, you're listening to your favorite song and somebody turns it off? What happens to your brain? Keeps going, right? It's called audiation. You keep hearing it in your brain. That's because your brain pathway has been formed. You can't stop that pathway. Your brain still goes down. Okay, it keeps going. Just like if you ask a kid who has gotten a pathway, may I have a cookie, please? And you tell them to say, can I have a cookie? They automatically, they're like, <laughs> they have to keep saying it. They have to say the please because it's part of the pathway. Okay, so we want a script for kids. This works. Not only does it work with the little kids, now as you're getting older with the older kids, what is the thing that drives us most nuts? And actually it does with the, the toddlers as well. Whining, obnoxious tone, right? Those teenagers, you know, their tone as they say things, if you, you can retone with scripting as well. You can say, you can't say it to me like that. What you can say is this, and give them the tone and have them repeat it, because tone goes with those pathways too. They learn the tone. If you have them keep repeating it that way and say, don't talk to me that way, 
you haven't taught them a different way to talk to you. Okay, so they're gonna still go back to that. Um, I'm working on my five-year-old with the, with the whining right now. It's like, oh, stop, and repeat it. And he's like, well, she already left. I don't care, repeat it. I want you to get practice saying it like this. Okay, so we need to do the scripting. And that is how you are going to get those pathways formed. Okay, now we're gonna put this together. All right, let's go to the next, please. Um, the scripting works with requests. You know, when they want something, you can have them repeat it with them. May I have a cookie, please? Repeating those. You can teach them pro-social interactions by having them repeat it. You know, instead of, um, you know, having them go up, can I play with you? And instead of them saying no, say, um, actually, my favorite one in this one is, when kids want to share a toy, right, the little kids? They grab a toy. No, you can't grab the toy, but you can say, can I have a turn, please? So instead of a parent deciding, okay, move over. Now, when they say, can I have a turn, please, what's the kid gonna say? No, no. no, of course not. Because they don't have any alternative other than no, and they can't think ahead to, I'll give you a turn when I'm done. So we can script for them, you know what? Can you say, I'll give you a turn when I'm done? And they say, I'll give you a turn when I'm done. And they've now learned that they have a strategy that it's not give it up now or don't give it up at all. They need that strategy. They don't know that. We can think of it, they can't. Okay, we say use their words, they don't have them. They don't know what to use, they don't know the pathways, give them a pathway. Um, and conflict resolution, this works really, really well, in, but I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, remember, remember the amygdala? Okay, it's always easy to say, let's do the pathways, but you can't do the pathways if you don't have a prefrontal cortex. You can't do it. You can't think of the ways to make those pathways. So we have something called trigger scripts. A trigger script is a pathway that is very, very short and directed. Okay, the idea behind a trigger script is to teach your kids a script to get out of there. If they are in a high, and teach yourself too, and I'll tell you that story. Um, if you're in a high, intense, emotional situation, <coughs> to get yourself away until you get your prefrontal cortex back. All right? So many times, <coughs> parents are arguing with their kid, and their kid tries to walk away and say, get back here when I'm screaming at you! <laughs> right? So that we can scream back and forth. They gotta get away. You have to get your prefrontal cortex back. You have to be able to think before you can work something out. It just doesn't work. We're in high emotion. So picture the two trains coming together. They're gonna crash. We need to get a signal to go, I, need, I can't do this right now. Um, so it's a very short phrase to get you out of there, get your prefrontal cortex back, and then be able to say, come back. Okay, timeouts. I love it when people say, you have a timeout for three minutes. <coughs> because I'm sure in three minutes, your prefrontal cortex is gonna be right back here. Let's think about that, okay, now. Oh, but you're four, so we'll do four minutes. I'm sure that'll, actually, they get their prefrontal cortex back later. They, they get it back quicker when they're older, hopefully, than when they're younger. Um, so what this is, is it's kind of like a timeout, but it directs them where to go, get their prefrontal cortex back, and then gives them the control to come back. So here's the way it goes, and I'm, I'm trying to get time, so I'm gonna go quickly here. All right, so a kid get, gets angry, they're having a fight. Steps! That's the trigger script, steps. My kids know when I say steps, it means you're out of control, you need to go to the steps. You need to go somewhere, get yourself together, and then come back when you're ready to talk to one another. Steps is mine. Okay, so one day I'm with my kids, and my five-year-old says to me, Mom, when you get angry, and then you don't get that angry, but to us, you're like a Zuba. Okay, I, the people who laugh watch The Last Airbender. They've seen The Last Airbender cartoon. For those of you who haven't watched it, Azula is evil incarnate. <laughs> okay, so she, of course, she was smart enough to tell me when I was calm. And she said, you know, when you're angry to us, you're like Azula. It scares us. I said to her, okay, next time I'm angry, I want you to say Azula. That's all I want you to say. She's like, oh, really? <laughs> like, yeah, really. And the next time I was angry, she said Azula. And boy, did that trigger my brain. I walked away really fast. We need a trigger to get away and get our brain back. Um, and then once we get away, we can come back and we can script the situation 
and script will go back to the four F. All right, what was the situation? What, did, what happened here? What, did, what can we learn about yourself? What can we learn about the situation? So let's brainstorm some strategies that you could have done and let's brainstorm, you know, what are the support systems that you could have called on to help you with this. So the idea behind this is let's get a plan in place. Let's have our kids know how they can get away from a situation. <coughs> this teaches them the self-control. This teaches, these are the skills that build up the pathways in the prefrontal cortex. It's those skills, executive functioning skills, for them to be able to look at this stuff and say, okay, I can control my brain, I can get away, I can come back and talk briefly more. Okay? And we can do it ourselves too. It's funny because I was about to give this talk and yesterday I lost my camera big time for the first time in a long time. And I said to them on the way home, how come you didn't say amygdala? They were like, yeah, you were way gone. Uh, <laughs> um, so is it gonna work all the time? No, it's not. It's just not. You know, we're gonna have time when we're overstressed, we're trying to get out, we're late, or you know, my husband just adopted a puppy. Um, and <laughs> you know, that we're just out of control of stress. It's not always gonna work. Does it work a lot of the time? Yeah, it really does. It really helps to know that we're going into our mental. It really does. Okay, so um, the, the plan during the uh, conflict, oh, by the way, with this, when you say a trigger script, walk away, don't engage. You know, you say go to the steps and they're like, no! <clears throat> What's going to happen? If I call and turn around and talk to them, are we going to have a, a good conversation? No. Don't talk to me till we can talk reasonably. And there's a lot of times that the kids come back and they say, Mom, I'm ready. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not ready to talk to you. And you really don't want me to talk to you right now. So go back to the steps. Or you can go do something, but I'll, ca I'll call you together when I'm ready. OK, and then after the conflict, script the conversation for kids. Um, they're not going to know how to talk to you. They're not going to know how to tell you what happened. They're not going to know how to talk to one another. They need adults to teach them that so that then eventually they can do it on their own. Um, we give a ton of examples in the book. I can't give them, but really using those four S's all the time when you're talking to kids. Did the strategy work for you? When, when things don't work, like um, my daughter yesterday was saying that some kids on the playground were, were chasing her and teasing her, and, and she was like, well, I, I kept telling them to stop. So did it work for you? She was like, no. I said, well, let's brainstorm some other strategies. You know, it was the boys who kept chasing her, so I said, I'll give you a hint. If you turn around and say, I know you can't be, I know you don't want to stay away from me, but you know, I just need some time on my own, and they're like, oh boy. <laughs> you know, that'll get rid of them really fast. Um, I know I'm beautiful, but um, so giving them alternate strategies, giving them support systems, telling them honestly about themselves and the challenges that they face. Um, honesty is really important. We try and hide sometimes for kids the challenges that they have. We try and do it for them. We don't want them to go through the pain. But you know what? The pain is what what makes things worth worth it. The uncomfortable feelings that you have about it makes it all worth it. Okay, and I think that's it.